Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Exodus chapter 34, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two, two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before the mat, that mountain. So the Lord's saying, look, it's now time, Moses, come back up on the mountain to replace the two tablets that you broke. Now I'm going to write on them again, but the creation of these tablets, now you need to work. I gifted them to you the first time. Now you need to replace what you broke. You need to make restitution for what you broke and you need to re uh, you need to recut these two stone tablets and bring them up. Once again, like last time, don't let anyone on the mountain. It is you and you alone that will come up. Because this is to be set apart and holy for my presence. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The Lord is perfect, perfect in sovereignty, perfect in love, perfect in justice. What the Lord says he is, is what he is. He loves us enough to grant us salvation. He loves us enough to have to make that choice. Because love isn't controlling. He is sovereign above all things. He has created all things. But he's allowed that creation a free will to make choices. Choices that we either have salvation in love or punishment by his perfect justice. We will all be judged whether in Christ or not in Christ. But that first judgment is, are you cloaked in the righteousness of Christ? Okay. Now you'll be judged on the fruit you produced in your life while being a branch of that vine, of the true vine of Christ. Whereas that first judgment of, do you have Christ or not? And it's not then you're going to be judged by your works. You can be judged by grace according to the blood of Christ, or you can be judged by the works according to the world. And one misstep, one, one sin ever so slight means you have broken the whole of it. You chose to be judged by the world standards, by the standards of that wide path of destruction, then you will travel towards it, to your eternal destination. Perfect judgment. Each of us judged by the same rules, by the same categories. We aren't judged differently because we had more money because we were greater athletes, because we were more famous. No, those are the judgments of man, not the judgments of a perfect God. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. 
Then he said, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my word, let my Lord, I pray, go among us. Even though we are a stiff necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And he said, behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. And this is something that they do. God has told them, I am not driving all the people out all at one time. Because if we do that, then the land's gonna the land's gonna die because you're gonna have to go and farm this land for yourself. I'm not no longer gonna be providing manna for you. Once you get into the promised land, it's on you to start to work the land I've given you. If I drive everyone out right away, one half the land's gonna be go, gonna lie fallow too long. It's going to dry up. It's going to wither because you're not going to be there yet. So I'm going to slowly be driving these people out from before you. So as that's happening, do not make covenants with the inhabitants of the land, lest it be a snare. And time and time, time and time again, we see this happen where it does indeed become a snare. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifices to their gods. And one of them invites you to eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. So he's saying, this is going to be the snare. You start making covenants. You start intermarrying, which, remind everyone again, intermarrying in scripture has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with faith. It has to do with intermarrying in between faiths. Interfaith marriages are what are forbidden for the Israelites. You do not intermarry in an interfaith relationship because by doing that, you are compromising your walk with the Lord because now you're sharing common communion with their idol, with their false pagan God, which we are told in scripture are demonic in origin. We're told by Paul, let no man preach to you another gospel than the one that we have brought to you. If anyone brings another gospel, let them be accursed, whether it be us ourselves and come to you again with a different gospel, or even an angel comes to you, let them be accursed. Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, Mormons, all claim to have a later gospel preached to them by an angel. And what was Lucifer and his angels? I mean, his, and his demons? Fallen angels. The enemy will always try to drive us from the one true God, from his Messiah, from Christ. And they have no problem masquerading as angelic beings to do it and cause us to play the harlot and pull us through our lusts of the world, pull us to compromise our walk with the Lord. Don't make a covenant with those who want to pull you from God. 
because they're going to be a snare in your walk. The Lord went to the Gentiles, commanded Peter and Paul to go to the Gentiles, but not to be of the Gentiles, but to be in their presence as a light for the one true God, not compromising in any way with them as a way to stumble in to idolatry and harlotry against the one true God. You shall make no molded gods for yourselves. The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you. In the appointed time of the month of Abib, for the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, and every first male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep, but the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. <clears throat> so we're going over this again. Once again, they already they quickly broke the covenant, so God's restating the entire covenant again. Like, hopefully you can get these people to understand it this time, Moses. But all the those that open the womb, all the firstborn males are are to be the Lord's. And it is a, a restitution. It is a redemption for all the firstborn of males, livestock, humans who had to die to bring the people out of Egypt. The God, the God of all creation didn't exactly just say, I don't really care for the Egyptians. Their lives mean nothing to me. And throw away the firstborn of all of them. No. And he's making his people understand that. They had to be sacrificed to free you. And now that sacrifice is going to be honored by having to redeem the firstborn male of all your children and livestock. Because the Lord doesn't do anything on a whim. He doesn't do anything maliciously. This is what the Egyptians drove him to, but it's not what he wanted. The Lord would have preferred from the time of Adam that no one left the garden. The Lord would have preferred from the time of Noah that everyone had not turned to evilness continually and just turned to him. But they didn't. And God has to punish those he loves. And we're told he loves his creation. He loves his creation enough to sacrifice his son for it. Now then people will turn around. Well, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Yes. Jacob I loved to become the nation that salvation would come through. Esau I hated because he rejected me. I had anonymity between me and Esau because Esau rejected me. Esau rejected his birthright twice over. Esau wanted the world over God. Jacob wanted God over the world. And the nations that flowed out from them followed the same basic pattern. It's our heart and our standing with the Lord that puts us at an anonymity with him or in relationship with him. And none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of the weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of the ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before me, the Lord God of Israel, 
and I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. So basically saying there's three year, three days, the Passover. Um, there's three holy days, the Passover, Pentecost, days like these where you're going to have to go up to, um, at the time, the tabernacle, then became where Jerusalem, because the temple, where all the male Jews are to go on these three days to make a journey to appear before the Lord, to sacrifice before the Lord. And he's promising that in these days, when you go up, that you don't have to worry about your land being taken from you by opposing nations because no one will covet your land during these times. You may have war other times, but during these times, no one is going to come for you because you are doing right in being obedient to me. I will keep them from your land. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So the first of the first fruits, we are to give him the first and best off the top. Not what we have left over, but our best. Um, it goes back to the sacrifices of Cain and Abel. And I've heard some people incorrectly, although it sounds persuasive, it's incorrect because we're told it's incorrect in Hebrews. But we're told that people make the point of saying, well, Abel's was accepted because his was a blood sacrifice and it's all about the blood. It's all about the blood because the blood of Christ. So that's why Cain's because he did it with the work of his hands. And we're not told that in scripture anywhere. All it says is that the Lord tells Cain that if his sacrifice had been done properly, it would have been accepted. Another thought is that he didn't give his first fruits. He didn't give the best he had. He just gave something and that wasn't good enough. We're told in Hebrews, it was a case of faith. Cain did not appear before God with his heart in the proper place. So his offering was not accepted because of it. As Jesus would go on to say, if you have an offering for the temple, you have an offering for God, but your heart houses wickedness to your brother, it's best to leave your sacrifice. Go make amends with your brother before you offer to the Lord. Because that is more important than the sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And obedience to the two commandments, which the Lord Jesus Christ has set before us, is to love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind and spirit, and to love our neighbor like ourselves. And those two commandments encapsulate the Ten Commandments. So the offering, that's something that should be done, but the second of those commandments to love your neighbor like yourself, get your heart right with God. With your, get your heart set right with your brother before you go to God. Because if you're harboring animosity, then your heart is not in the right place. Paul tells us the same thing about taking the Lord's Supper. If you have a problem with another brother or sister, you need to go make that right before you partake in the communion. And I feel like that's something that during communion, a lot of the denominations that do communion on a weekly basis do not take into consideration whatsoever because that's just become a ritual to them, that this is just something they do and they don't hold it in the place of holiness that it should be. Some denominations do it way too infrequently. Some do it way too often. <coughs> as to make it meaningless <clears throat> because our heart should be for the communion 
Our heart should be set for that, to be in communion, to be feasting with the Lord. Now, the second part of this verse, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. That's because of perversion. One, because it's mixing death with life. Another is you're, you're mixing a child and cooking it in the milk that was meant to nurture it. It's a perversion of life and death, things that should be separate. Then the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and, your, and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. So Moses started to glow in the glory of God. And when the people saw it, they were freaked out by it. They were afraid and they didn't know what to think now. They saw what happened last time he came down from the mountain. They did not want to repeat of that. So now they're not sure what's happening. They're freaked out about it. Then Moses called to them and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them the commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would come, he would take off the veil until he came out, and he would come out and speak to the children of Israel when, whenever he had been commanded, or whatever he had been commanded. And what, whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So from here on out, Moses would wear a veil. When he spoke with the Lord, he would take the veil off. When he spoke with the people, he would put the veil on so they would not be as freaked out about his shining face and his shining skin. That was imparted to him by being in the presence of the Lord and being and experiencing his direct glory. So moving on to chapter 35, verse 1. Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel and said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath day of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair. Ram skin dyed red, badger skins and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So here we're going to start moving into the creation of the tabernacle. Moses is saying, the Lord has asked and commanded, saying, take from among you an offering of whoever has a willing heart. Don't steal from them, but whoever wants to give to the Lord, take it from them for the creation of this tabernacle. Moses is trying to lead his people back into a right standing, giving them the Ten Commandments again, giving them the way in which they've lived. Once again, mentioning the Sabbath day, you're about to get holy work, work that is holy and set aside solely for God, do not forsake the Sabbath day in the process of doing this work. Make sure you keep the Sabbath holy to keep his day of rest holy. The day he gave you. The day he gave you to rest and reflect on the blessings you have in him. And the work that you have done 
and to reflect on the work you have to do in the coming days. And that's something Christians from the time of the early church started celebrating their Sabbath, so to speak, on the Sunday, on Sunday, on the Lord's day, the Lord, the day he had risen. That is when they decided we are going to gather on this day. Now in our modernized secular world, that Lord's day has become far less holy. It has been day that we now do work on it is a day that we now do all sorts of things that we probably shouldn't. And it's a day where we often don't take the time to relax because we have other things we need to do that we cannot do during our work week. But my appeal to this is regardless if you're one of the Christians who believe that you should still keep a Saturday Sabbath, or if you're like most of Christianity has been throughout history and you continue to Sabbath, so to speak, on the on Sunday, which is not really the Sabbath day, but on the day that we get, gather as a church in the name of Christ, is that we keep time separate and holy for the Lord. That we still recognize that even though we may have to do things on this day of rest, that we elevate nothing to the level of the Lord. Church is something we should go into willingly. Not something we should be dragged into by our wives or dragged into by our parents or something we should be begrudgingly going into so we can get that tick mark that says we were at church today. We did the good holy God thing today. It's something we should look forward to. It's something we should look forward to because that is our chance to gather with the brethren, to listen to the word of God, to be edified about his word. And if your church doesn't really even teach the word of God and it's always topical sermons and pop culture and feel good messages and basically you are led by a, a public speaker or a self-help teacher, uh, which some pastors even claim it will even admit they are. Joel Osteen is flat out said, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm a self-help speaker. Well, if that's where you're getting the word of God, I suggest you, you go to a real church, one that will lead you in the word of God, lead you properly in a way that shows you how to be set apart for God, to be holy. Church, the word of God, it's not a tick box. It is a life that we walk out. There's no feel good message that can bring you in the right standing with God. There's no feel good message that brings you edification. need to take our walk seriously. We need it to bear fruit. We need to set apart that day of rest and make sure we are living for the Lord as he wishes us to live. Take that day to reflect on what our week was like what our week ahead is going to be and reflect on what the Lord has been teaching us 
and showing to us in his word through our prayers to show us how he wants us to walk in the week to come, how he wants us to operate in a way that will be best for growing his kingdom, for planting the seeds of his gospel, watering seeds that others have already planted. Because although we do not observe a Sabbath day to our shame like the Israelites did, that doesn't mean that God becomes a tick box. If we're in church staring at our watch, wondering how long this is going to go on because I have something else to do, we need to ask ourselves where our heart is. Christ said our heart is where our time and treasure are. What are we dedicating our time to? What are we spending our treasure and money on? That's where our heart is. If we're looking at the clock or our watch and going, man, man, this pastor feels like he's going long today. The Eagles game starts in like half an hour. Man, I I have some shopping I need to do. Man, I really want to get out of here at a good time. That way I can beat the traffic to the beach. Then where's our heart? Is our heart with God? Or is our heart with the idol of the beach? The idol of professional football? Where's our heart? Where is our heart? Is it for the Lord or is it not? Because there's only two answers. We're either setting ourselves apart for him. Or we're shoehorning him into the world we would rather live in. There's really no middle ground. We tow a line even when we've set ourselves apart for him. But if we're going through the motions... We're not setting ourselves apart for him. We're shoehorning him in to the fleshly existence we're living. All right, well, that's where we'll end for this morning. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you again next time. But until then, be blessed.